Welcome everyone to the Unit 1 note video number 2 on the scientific method. I am sure that you have learned about the scientific method in the past. In fact, every single year you've probably learned about the scientific method. Now, you might have learned sometimes it has seven steps, some teachers teach that it has four steps, the one that we're going to use in class is five steps, but it's all the same. Um, remember, science is just the, the method at which we discover things and figure, figure stuff out. So however the person doing it wants to break it down in steps, is, it's all still the scientific method. But the one in this class is going to have five steps. And step number one is observe a problem or ask a question. So this is where it all starts. You're either gonna gonna look at something that, that needs fixed and try to figure out how to fix it, or ask a question, because all of science is about trying to figure something out. Then you make your hypothesis, design your experiment, analyze your data, and finally make your conclusion. Uh, you might want to take a moment to put a little star next to this or something, because you are going to need to know each of these steps in order. Um, so, observe a problem, make a hypothesis, design an experiment, analyze your data, draw a conclusion. Once you do it a couple times, it's really just a logical progression of discovery. <laughs> so, there is a method to this madness of science. So, anyone who's ever been curious about something and has wanted to try to find an answer has used the scientific method been going on ever since mankind has been around. So, we are going to walk through the scientific method under the guise of Mr. Regal is doing his best to grow a garden, which I am not very good at. So, step one. Well, to make an observation, you're going to use your five senses. Take a moment to think of if you can come up with all five senses. So we have hearing, we have sight, we have taste, we have touch, and we have smell. Those are your five senses. So in class, when you make observations, you will be using all of them, except for which one? Yep, yeah, you're not going to be tasting anything in science class. Probably not, anyway. So as soon as you write down an observation, then it becomes what we call data. Now, here's the situation. I'm peeking over my fence, trying to see what my neighbor is doing, because his garden always seems to be better than mine. And I'm scoping out his garden, and his tomato plants are always at least two feet taller than mine, and they give him four times the amount of fruit. What is it that he's doing that I am not doing? So, which parts of this are qualitative and which parts of this are quantitative. I'm going to give you a few moments to write down what you believe is a qualitative observation and a quantitative observation. So remember, if it's quantitative, it uses numbers. If it's qualitative, it doesn't use numbers. It uses descriptions. So. A qualitative observation could just be that my neighbor's garden is better than mine, and that it makes more food. Quantitative is when you pull the numbers in, so the tomato plants are two feet taller and make four times the tomatoes. So you're, we're going to be doing a lot of this, so don't forget your qualitative and your quantitative. So in science, it's really important never to assume anything. Whenever you um, make an observation and it doesn't quite work out to be the reason that you think, um, we talked about this in the last set of notes, that's what we call an inference. So, important vocab term you're seeing twice. So, develop a hypothesis is step two. We've made our observations, we've asked our questions, now we can start to kind of try to figure out why it is the way that it is. So as it turns out, 
hypotheses are pretty much inferences. We've made observations and we're going to try to now explain why we observed what we did. So my neighbor's garden is better. Um, it has more, more, more tomatoes and taller plants. So I'm going to try to explain why those observations exist. And in doing so, really I'm making an inference. So one day, I noticed that my neighbor, I'm spying on him over the fence there, he doesn't know I'm watching, and he uh, sneaks out and he mixes fertilizer in with the garden. Well, this gives me an idea. Maybe it's the fertilizer that's causing his plants to grow better. But how can I know? So I come up with a hypothesis. If I add fertilizer to my soil before planting the tomato plants, then I believe my plants will grow taller and make more tomatoes because fertilizer contains a secret chemical that makes plants grow faster. In the elementary school building, in the, the Scott Avenue building, you probably learned that a hypothesis should be written as an if-then statement. If I do this, then this will happen. That is okay, but it is a very elementary version of a hypothesis. FYI, don't ever define a hypothesis as an educated guess. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. It's, that's a horrible definition. Not only will you not get points for it, I'll probably knock off hit points just out of spite. So, it's not an educated guess. A hypothesis, a well-written hypothesis, should have an if, a then, but this is the most important part, the because. So if I do this, then this will happen, but this is where it starts becoming science because we start explaining why the then takes place. And when you do an experiment, it's this part that you're actually testing whether or not it's true. It's your because that you're actually testing. So any hypothesis that you write for class, I want to see in if-then-because format. So if you can't use educated guess as a definition for a hypothesis, what should you use? This one right here. Nice and simple. It's also two words. A hypothesis is a testable explanation. It's an idea that you can test. If you can't test it, then it's not a hypothesis. So all hypotheses have to be testable. And as long as it's testable, it's a good hypothesis. It doesn't have to necessarily be correct to be a good hypothesis. In fact, most hypotheses actually turn out to be wrong. But we're looking for the if-then-because format, and that because is the most important part. So step three is designing an experiment. So thanks to that guy that you learned about in seventh grade, Francesco Redi, uh, he was doing work, if you don't remember, on spontaneous generation, and he was uh, the first one to disprove spontaneous generation. Can't forget the stuff you learn in seventh grade. He was the very first scientist ever to conduct what's called a controlled experiment. And this is an experiment where you have two groups. You have one group that you leave like it normally is, and another group where you tinker with, and then you see if the two groups end up being different. And if they do end up being different, it's the result of what you were tinkering with. So in any experiment, variables are things that can be changed. So let's think of some variables that Mr. Regal would have to, have to be careful of if I was doing this experiment. What is it that I would have to um, what, what, what can affect plant growth that I would have to make sure that I was monitoring? Well, what do all plants need? Water and sunlight are the easy ones. See if you can write down a couple that aren't, that in, see if you can write down a couple in addition to water and sunlight, and maybe we'll bring them up in class. What are some things that can affect how big and how well plants grow? So from, from Reddy's work, uh, we know that we should always have a control group. This is the group that you don't do anything with. This is the group that's like normal. 
and then you have your experimental group. Now you can have more than two groups. You can have a whole bunch of experimental groups if you want, but you always have that one control group. And then any differences between the control group and the experimental group are actually what you're experimenting with. So you should only ever have one variable that's different at a time. So like I said, you can have four different experimental groups, but each of those experimental groups is only changed by one thing. And it's really important that you're only changing one thing at a time because when you have a measurable difference in the end of your experiment, you need to be able to say that it's this one variable that caused that difference. If you change ten things, you won't know which one it was or if it was some combination of, of two or three. So here's my experiment. I'm going to test this hypothesis that, hi that adding fertilizer would make the plants grow better because it has a secret growth chemical in it by having two groups of tomato plants. So I have group A, and group A has 10 tomato plants in it, and it's planted in a part of the garden that has never before seen fertilizer. Then I have group B, and there's 10 tomato plants also in group B, and it's going to be planted in a new part of the garden where I am mixing fertilizer in with the soil. So then I'm going to make observations. So we're going to do these things called quick checks. So here is a really important question to really check if you are understanding well. Um, I'm not going to give you the answer here in the note video. Instead, when we get to class, we're going to have a little quick check session um, where you can talk in your group and uh, make sure that everybody thinks that they know what the right answer is, and then we'll share out as a class. So the first quick check is which of these two groups is the control group? And make sure you're also ready to tell me why. The second, why do we have 10 plants in each group? It's something that's a little bit trickier than the first one. Think about why we would have 10 plants in group A and 10 plants in group B. So when doing an experiment, in addition to the fact that there are two kinds of observations you can make, there's also two kinds of variables that we track. Now these go by different names. Um, you can call the first kind of variable the manipulated variable. I tend to call it the, the manipulated variable when I'm in conversation. This is the variable that you're actually manipulating. It's the, it's the variable that you're changing. It's, it's what the difference is between the control group and the experimental group. So this is what you're experimenting with. Now, it's also known as the independent variable. And while I prefer the term manipulated variable, on the PSSAs, they are going to call it the independent variable. So you're going to need to make sure that you know this term. So when you take the PSSAs, on science and they ask you what the independent variable is in an experiment, don't miss it simply because you can't remember which one it is. The other variable is called the response variable or the dependent variable. So again, on the PSSAs, they're going to call it the independent variable and the dependent variable. Now, it's called the response variable because it is the variable that's changing in response to the manipulated variable. You're manipulating something, and because you're manipulating something, some other aspect is responding. You can also think of it the same way with dependent. You can think that this, what this variable turns out to be depends on this variable, and this variable stands alone. This is the one that, that isn't affected by anything because you're setting it, and this one depends on this one. So maybe those little things will help you keep these straight. In the end, the response variable or the dependent variable is almost always the result of your experiment. It's almost always what you're measuring in the end. A couple more quick checks from this experiment with the fertilizer in the garden. Which variable is the independent one? And which variable is the dependent one? Again, we will Go over these questions in class. One of the most important reasons that you need to be able to keep the independent and dependent variables straight is that when we go to make graphs, 
there is a very, very, very important rule. If I were you, I would put a big star on this little window in the notes. I'd mark it all up. Put a big star on here. Star. Oh, that's not the right kind of color. Star, 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 star. This is something that you're going to need to remember. The response variable or the dependent variable always goes on the y-axis. So if you make a graph and you put the wrong variable on the wrong axis, if you flip it around, you're not going to get full credit for that graph. So the response variable always goes on the y-axis. So make sure, number one, you can pick out which, which variable is the response variable, and number two, that you know which axis is the y-axis. Now, in case you don't remember which axis is the y-axis, here are your axes for the graph. Change this little line thing here. So, if you put little bunny ears on it, it becomes a Y. So that's your Y axis. Because if you put bunny ears on this one, you don't have a Y, you just have a dead bunny. Now, this leads us up to the second booby trap. There are 12 questions on this booby trap, so make sure you look over the notes between the last booby trap and this one and get, <clears throat> get ready for the questions in class. Thank you very much.